pray together today. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus, and we're grateful for your goodness and your mercy and your kindness. Father, I pray that you would renew us today, you would fill us today with your strength and with your power. God, we give you all the glory and the honor. Father, we just surrender to you today. Work in our hearts, work in our minds. Fill us with you. In Jesus' precious name. If you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Come on, y'all. Give God some praise. It's a great day to be in the house of God. I tell you what, let's welcome those that are online with us this morning. Good morning, everybody. Glad you're with us. And now, if you could turn around and say hi to somebody right around you, and you can take your seat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew, and we're so glad you're here with us today. If this happens to be your first time at City Point, welcome. We hope you've enjoyed the service so far. If you'd like more information about us, text WELCOME to the number on the screen. It really is the best way to connect with our team and learn more about the church. Now, before we continue, we'd like to take a second and highlight some team members who use their gifts and talents to serve families every week. I love this segment because we get to honor some awesome individuals and hear their hearts behind why they serve faithfully at City Point. First is Vanessa Hernandez, who serves on our Next Steps team. She says, serving is a blessing for me and an opportunity to bless others. I grew up in church, but didn't really serve in the church until I had my own family. I saw firsthand that the best way to honor my relationship with God was to serve Him and His people. I'm honored I get to model that for my own children and hope my faithfulness inspires them to be a blessing to others as well. Let's all be like Jesus, serve one another, and join a team. I promise there's a perfect place for you. Vanessa, thank you so much for loving people at City Point with your warm demeanor and faithfulness to help those around you. You're an amazing asset to our Next Step team and constantly inspire us to serve people better. Next is Joe Ariola, who serves on our hospitality and parking teams. He says, I love serving because it gives me the opportunity to make someone feel welcome on their first day at City Point. I still remember the first time my family visited this church and I'll always be grateful to the volunteers who made us feel at home. Joe, you're awesome, man. Coming full circle and creating moments for new people is what it's all about. Thank you for your heart and determination to help people feel God's love when they walk into our church. If you see Joe or Vanessa around today, make sure to show them some love and thank them for their hard work. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the teams they serve on, or any Point team for that matter, head over to citypointchurch.com volunteer and see all the different ways you can get involved. As Vanessa said earlier, we're pretty confident there's a perfect place for you. I don't know if you noticed yet, but we love Christmas here at City Point. In fact, we built a whole website dedicated to all the things we've planned for your family and the community. Head to citypointchurch.com slash Christmas and see how this year will be the best Christmas ever. Oh, and speaking of Christmas, I know Thanksgiving hasn't even happened yet, but we're having four services across three days starting Thursday, December 22nd through Saturday, December 24th. We highly suggest that you register your family now before your preferred service time hits capacity. We are expecting a full house at each service this year, so save your spot now before it's too late. All right, that's what's happening at City Point. If you've missed something or if you have any questions, feel free to talk to our team at the info desk or shoot us an email at info at citypointchurch.com. All right, grab your notes and get ready for Pastor Eddie as he continues our series, Life Hacks.
good day to be in the house of God. I'm not 100%, so I'm on some decongestants plus some heart meds and coffee. So there's some neat chemistry going on in my body right now. So whatever I say, I don't take credit for it, all right? So y'all be patient as I work through this this morning. Julie is still out today because she's not feeling good. So it's a cesspool at our house right now. So I'm just trying to uh, stay healthy. So anyway, so let's talk about uh, what's going on today. We have Connection Point going on this afternoon and uh, I want to encourage you, maybe as your New Year's resolution, say, hey, I want to join City Point this year. This is your last chance to do it, or it's going to have to bump to 2023. So let me put it to you this way. It's super easy. If you go to lunch in Allen, you're going to be there an hour at least, right? That's already here at the church. So you got that. Add another hour to it. You're a member of the church. All done. Fixed up. Our lunch is free, and you don't have to give us a tip. So join. Come to Connection Point today. Stick around after third service. We'd love to have you there. Uh, we talk about who we are as a church, and then we just talk about who you are as a believer, and what does that mean, and, and the spiritual gifts that you have, and personality things, and, and just we try to give you something for coming and, and being a part of the church to help you be who God's called you to be. Also, this new year coming up, I know it's just a date on the calendar, but I know it's always for me, it's been a time of a reset where there's areas in my life I say, hey, I want to grow in this area, work in this area, this calendar year is a turnover. So we're going to have church on January the 1st. Our last, we're not going to have an early service, right? Uh, but we'll have our 1015, our 1145. And then uh, I want to encourage you, we're also going to have water baptism on January the 8th. So if you have not been water baptized, go ahead and plan now in January to start your year off right and let the world know, hey, I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. So uh, today we're going to jump into our series called Life Hacks. We've already talked about stress. We've talked about depression. We've talked about faithfulness. And so before we talk about the topic of today, y'all sent in some life hacks. So I want to show a couple to you real quick before we jump into the word. For me, I really like corn. What do you like about corn? It's corn. A good corn that not It has the juice. Okay, apparently this is the easiest way to poach an egg and all you need is a strainer. That's it. All you gotta do, look, she pours the eggs into the strainer, and she pours them in the water, and doesn't touch them. She doesn't even do a spinny thing. I she thought you had to spin it. You don't have to spin it. Look, she don't even do it. Look at this poach. Perfectly. Look at that. This has to be on a fake video. Oh, why'd you plop it in there like that, you animal? Look at this. You have to start over. Okay, now leave it. Don't mess with it. Just one egg. You're crazy. Throw it in, throw it in, throw it in. Okay. Now it's not She said we just sit. She said we just wait. That thing's cooking so fast. Oh, wow. Look how fast that thing's cooking. Gentle, don't go crazy. <gasps> what? Are you absolutely kidding me? What is <gasps> oh, that's, that's, the, that's the juiciest. And so if you're wondering what we're having for lunch for Connection Point, it's corn and poached eggs. So uh, we're, we're, we're ready for you. Um, today, I want to talk to you about people problems. Um, I think there's two types of people we see during the holidays. One is the person you just can't wait to be around. Maybe it's a group of friends or even maybe it's family. You just can't wait to see them. And then there's the other group of people that you just can't wait to get away from. So you, you're just like, man, let's head home. Is it time to go? You know, or maybe you just hope that it's canceled. And so I want to help you with that second group of people that maybe it's difficult. Maybe this year, this time of the year is difficult for you because of the people and the hurt and the history that you have with some of these relationships. Maybe it's an in-law, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's siblings, maybe it's friends, maybe it's a stepmom or dad, maybe you're divorced and this time of the year is really tough because of the relationships and the complexities that are involved. But I want to help you with that today. So let's pray and let's jump into it. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and I just thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your kindness. God, you loved us, but your love was also a lesson. And I pray that we're students of your love today. Father, we learn how to love and treat one another based on how you love and treat us, God. I pray that, Father, you'd work through the things we put up in our life, the things that stop us from fully enjoying all that you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, I want to share the story of two brothers, um, Esau and Jacob. They're the sons of Isaac. They're the grandsons of Abraham. They're a very special family in Scripture. And even though they have a great calling, it did not stop them from having great problems. You can be a great person and have a difficult relationships in your life. Now, the, the problem is, is not necessarily we're bad people. They're just humans. And we as humans sometimes can complicate relationships. In fact, I would say if there's one thing probably involved 
in this relationship that complicated it was money. It was the heritage, the lineage from his father, the blessing uh, of the home. And so Esau was born first, and obviously I'm leaving a lot out of this story. I encourage you to go to Genesis 25, kind of read on from there to get all the details of this story, but I'm just trying to get through parts of it. But Esau was the firstborn. He was the heir to his dad's wealth. He was the, um, the next seat in that throne, basically, of that family. Not that they had a throne, but he was the lineage of the heir. And Jacob was the secondborn. And these two boys were totally different from birth. Uh, Esau was an outdoorsman. Scripture speaks that he smelled of the outdoors, that his skin was rugged and tough and hairy uh, because of his time out in the outdoors. And uh, his brother Jacob was the opposite. He was an indoors guy. He liked to cook with mom and watch HGTV. And um, he had smooth skin and he smelt good. And his dad Isaac was getting old and he was worn down. His ear hearing wasn't good. His eyesight wasn't good. And he knew it was time for him to pass things on, the blessing on to his eldest son. And so he told Esau, go out and go hunting for me. I love wild game. Go grab me some game and cook me my favorite meal. And so Esau went out to go hunting. And, and if any of you hunt, you know that you can't rush that. It's a process. So he's out looking for the perfect meal for his father. And Jacob and his mother had this idea. Let's just go kill a lamb and dress you up and that you'd smell like your brother Esau. And you can go steal the birthright from your dad. And that's exactly what they did. Through a process of deception, that's what occurred. So his dad prayed for Jacob, put that blessing, put that birthright on him. And so from that moment on, that was something that's irrevocable. The only way it would be uh, changed is if Jacob died, it would pass to the next one. And so as this took place, Esau came back and he figured out the story that the birthright had been stolen from him. And he got irate. He said, I'm going to murder my brother it's really, I think in his mind, it's the way he would get his birthright back. But number one, for what his brother did. But number two, is that it would fall to him and his lineage. But there's another part of this story, and it's the reason why Jacob did what he did, is Esau, uh, before, made a decision after coming in from another one of his hunts to sell his birthright to his brother for a bowl of soup. He was that hungry. And if you've ever been that hungry, you understand. But you still, that was a bad decision. He says this in Hebrews 12. If you're godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance, writes as the oldest son. Scripture does not fault Jacob on that, but Scripture actually faults Esau for being willing to sell his birthright. So as you can see, this is a very messy story. Both of them have dirt on their hands. Both of them are guilty. One deceived, one sold a birthright. And it's honestly the way most of our relationships work. Most of us know that, hey, I didn't act perfectly. They didn't act perfectly perfectly. But nevertheless, you're kind of put in this place where the relationship is broken or stressed or strained. And these two brothers both had a part to play. And it's kind of that old saying that most of the time when you're hurt by somebody, you say is, what, well, hurt people, hurt people. And that's what happened with these brothers. So Jacob uh, runs, and um, he runs, and he runs from his brother because he was afraid of his death. So here they were, both single men at the time, and he ran. For 20 years, Jacob lived away from his homeland, but by then, after 20 years, he got married a couple times, had a bunch of kids. God really blessed him, and he desired to go back home. He desired to live on the land that his father and his, and his family had lived on, and he made a decision to go back. But here is the question that he had. Was he able to go home? What he saw when he saw his family just kill them outright, is there something to even be recovered? Is there something that could take place? Is there a way that I can move back into this home country without Esau raining down his vengeance upon me one more time. And so as I read this story and meditated on it, I saw a couple of life acts that I thought for our relationships, for our, for our life. And so I want to share that with you. And here's the truth about relationship. If you're going to be loved by somebody, you're going to be hurt by somebody. It's impossible to have a relationship with no pain, not a genuine one, not a one where you share lives and you live in close quarters and bump around and kind of share the stories together. And I've taught on forgiveness before, and I kind of many times teach it from this perspective of you're 100% in, innocent. But honestly, I don't know in many of us, and obviously there are some exceptions to this truth, rarely are we 100% innocent in any of the difficulty that we have in relationship. And so I want to start off with this very first idea that helps us in our relationships, is we have to own our own actions and our own attitudes. Yeah. We have to own them. We can't play them off. We can't say it's them, it's him, it's this, that, that. We just have to say, I responded badly, out of bad attitude, whatever that was. 
In fact, Jesus kind of put it this way. He said, before you can take the log, uh, the speck out of your brother's eye, he goes, you've got to work on the log in your eye. You've got to work out on your perspective of how you see them. You've got to work out on the things going on in your heart before you can actually deal with somebody else. Because as long as you view what they have as, as a log and you as the speck, you're not seeing yourself properly to make a resolution to fix a relationship in your life. And so you kind of have to start and go back to your own heart and go back to your own life because this is what Jesus is teaching us about relationship. Don't live as a victim. Choose to be strong. Choose to be better. Choose to be a child of God. Choose to take out the own tra- your own trash in your soul. Because here's the truth. If we don't deal with it and we don't, we don't own our own attitude and actions, it's this. If you're looking for offense, you will always find what you're looking for. In some of these relationships, and that's my next point, if you're, it's, if you're looking for offense you'll always find what you're looking for. Now, I say that because sometimes you're going to go see people, talk to people, and just the way they say hi, you may go, well, did you see how they said hi to me? <laughs> well, they just said hi. But you saw it through a filter, right? You saw it through something that allowed you to be offended at them right away. As a pastor over the last 30 years, I've been amazed at how some people can live in the life of the church, never be offended, or whatever they're offended over, they get over it, and they move on. They know we're all human, we're, none of us are perfect, we're all trying our best. But then every once in a while, somebody will come in, and they're just instantly offended within a year and walk out and, and just say horrible things. Why? Because maybe if you're looking for offense, you'll always find it. That's right. You've got to start with your own eyes and the way you view things. The second thing I, I think that can take place that can filter our relationships, it's why we got to take care of our own heart is bitterness, is the seed, that that pain that was sowed into your life, rather than being dealt with, has now grown and bore fruit in your life and has turned into a root of bitterness. Hebrews says this, work at living at peace with everyone. With who? Everyone. Work living a holy life with those who are not holy. Those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look for each other. Look Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. I would say bitterness is one of the most corruptive things in the body of Christ because what I've noticed about bitterness, that it never just stops in that relationship, but it seems to flow in every other relationship in your life. It just, like a weed, begins to bear fruit in your life. So what do we do in that area, that that in that area where the offense, where the pain has come, even if it's come year after year, or it's something you've got to deal with now uh, as an adult that maybe you grew up in as a home, as a child, that you have to make a decision that forgiveness is not a gift I give that person. Forgiveness is a gift I give myself. I set myself free from that pain. I set myself free. I may not be able to forget what they said, forget what they did, but I can unlock and make sure that no longer has the power to control my emotions and control my thoughts and control my actions. I want to be free from that. And forgiveness allows and it cuts the root of that bitterness. The story that I shared today with Jacob and Esau is a story of somebody trying to come home and make right something that was done wrong. So I want to start in Genesis 32, and we'll begin with little pieces of this story. And like I said, if you want, go back and read the whole thing. Now, before Jacob actually saw his brother, he was very introspective, Scripture tells us. He stopped and he prayed and he thought long and hard about this journey to go see Esau. But in this journey to go see his brother Esau, he stopped and he prayed to God, his heavenly Father. And he said this, and I want you to notice the tone of this prayer that he prayed. He says, O God, my father, 32.9, O God, my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac, The Lord who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. He says, I am unworthy of all your kindness and faithfulness that you've shown your servant. He didn't tell God, I deserve it. I've got this coming. You know, I've earned the right. It's mine, mine, mine. He didn't come at God with pride. He didn't come with God and say, listen, this is what I deserve. But he came with humility to his heavenly father. He said, I only had my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I've become two camps. He prays about his relationship with his brother. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid he will come back, he'll come and attack me, and also my mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. He prays over this relationship. He prays over his identity. He reminds God of who he is, but he also says, this is the relationship that I face, so how do I deal with this? I'm going to be a father of a great nation. Yet my brother wants to murder me. What, what, what do I, how do I approach this? What do I look at? And he began to pray about how his identity blends into his relationship with Esau. 
And moments after that, God wrestles with him, Scripture says, in the form of a man. And in this wrestling, Jacob would not let go of God until he was blessed by him. And in that blessing, he renamed him from Jacob, the deceiver, to Israel, the one who would basically bear fruit and become the father of a nation. So from this point forward, what Jacob grabbed a hold of as he went to deal with his brother Esau was his new identity that he had in God. And what we have to understand is when we seek God about our relationships, we also have to seek God about how we respond, not just out of that relationship, the context of that relationship, but out of our identity of who we are in God. Because it's no longer about you and another human. There's a third one in there. It's your heavenly father, and your identity that you have in him matters more than the human relationship sitting there in front of you. The truth is pain can be a part of your story, but it does not have to be your identity. What Jacob was saying is, I don't mind the pain, but I don't, that's not who I am. You promised me greater things, but this pain is all I can see. And so he made a decision that I'm going to go see my brother differently. Because I'll tell you this, don't allow pain to identify who you are. It makes you a slave to your past. Galatians 5 says this, Christ has set me free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never let anyone put a harness of slavery on you, whether it's religion or or pain, don't let anything make you its slave. And that's the second thing I'd like to say. Treat people based on your identity, not on your experiences. Yeah, good. When Jacob went back to see his brother, he said, this is who you said I was. This is how my brother sees me. But I'm making a decision that when I walk into my own country, when I cross this border, I am Israel. I'm no longer Jacob, God. So help me deal with the Esau. Help me deal with the pain. Help me deal with the difficulty, not based on what our experiences were, but based on who you've called me to be. And for some of us, as we step in to see people and talk to people that may make us uncomfortable, you have to make a decision. Either I'm a brother or a son or a daughter or whatever I am to them, or I am a child of the king first. And if you're a child of the king first, you act like the royal heritage that you have. You walk in love. You walk in power. You walk in grace. You walk in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit into that room. You are not in that room, at that dinner table, around that tree alone. There is a heavenly father who lives on the inside of you who will fill your mouth with the words that need to be said at the right moment. But you have to make a decision. I'm not eating this meal, talking to this person based on my experiences. I'm doing it based on my identity in God. It goes on in verse 33. Jacob looked up and saw there, there was Esau coming with his 400 men. Now I want you to imagine, here is Jacob. He is not prepared for, he's not a man of war. He's a shepherd to, uh, by trade. But his brother Esau comes at him with 400 men. That was not the symbolism of peace. You don't run at another man with 400 men of war if you're happy to see him. If, you can, if I invited you over to my house and I opened my door and pointed a shotgun in your face, you would not feel very welcomed at the moment. Or maybe you would. You'd be like, cool, I like guns. What? Most of you would be like, what am I doing? Eddie, what is Eddie doing? And basically Esau shows up, bristling, showing up who, who I am. I am strong, Jacob. I am, I am, you know, you, I'm not something to be dealt with. So how does Jacob do it? Does Jacob then bristle up and pull out his, and you know, hey, I'm a man too. Let, if we're going to do this, let's do this. Look at how he responds. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead of all of them and bowed down to the ground seven times. His brother shows up with 400 mighty men. He walks out in front of his entire family and bows seven times before his brother. What is that seven times? It's uh, complete humility, complete uh, just saying, you know, listen, I'm not here for trouble. I'm here to make restoration. And how does he deal with the, the bristling of his brother? He deals with his brother with humility. He he'd made a decision to set the tone of the next few moments of their life. And the tone that he was setting was a tone of humility. All of us set the atmosphere when we walk in a room. I'm sure you've been around people, maybe at work or maybe even at your home, that they walk into the room and all of a sudden the room gets tense, right? You can feel the anger. You can feel the angst when they walk in. And all of a sudden it changes the atmosphere of the room. I've done that. I've made that mistake at home. Sometimes I take the trouble of home and I show up at the house and everybody else was happy till I got there. And I change the atmosphere. But I also can change the atmosphere if I walk in and I'm like, hey, how's everybody doing? Love y'all. Good to see everybody. We set the tone. And what Jacob was doing is he was lowering the temperature of that meeting to a place of humility, to a place of joy, to a place of restoration. And when he did that, look at how his brother responded. So he went ahead about seven times to the ground. He approached his brother. 
But Esau jumped off his horse, ran past his 400 men to meet Jacob, and he embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him, and they wept. These two brothers who were at odds for 20 years, in one moment, they hugged and embraced and wept together. When we understand that what we can change the atmosphere by how we walk into a room, we have to understand that many times we bring atmosphere with us. And in difficult relationships, sometimes the best thing to do is decide what kind of atmosphere you want in that room and bring it with you that day. That brings me to my third point is this, walk in grace and humility. Notice the result when he, Jacob chose humility over his right. He could have said, you know what, I just wrestled with God and God said I would be blessed. He renamed me. I've got the right. You saw get off of my land. He didn't. He went with humility. And when we have grace and humility and we put that into where we go, it changes the atmosphere of what is around us. They hugged and they kissed and they wept together and they began to restore what was broken. They couldn't work through all the old issues. They just decided to make the past the past and to move forward. Colossians 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, this is your identity, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Maybe this year as you get ready for your Thanksgiving dinner or your Christmas dinner and you're going to go see some people that may be tough, maybe instead of worrying about what outfit you're wearing, you know, whether you're going to wear your Christmas sweater or not, why don't you put on some compassion? Put on some kindness. Put on some humility. And say, you know what, even if they take a jab at me this year, I'm not going to fire back. I'm going to walk in my new identity of who I am in God. I'm going to be gentle. I'm going to be patient with that knucklehead this year. I'm not going to pop off at them. I'm going to take it slow. I'm going to be a crock pot, not a microwave this year. I'm going to put something else on. He goes on. He says, bear with each other. Forgive one another. And if any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive them as the Lord forgave you. Yes. First Peter says this, all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud. But he shows his favor to who? The humble. Jesus taught us that humility is how you win the heart of the wrong. He humbled himself as a son of God. He didn't show up in his excellence. He didn't show up in his power. He showed up as one of us. And he laid down his life and took the suffering that we deserved. It's how he won our heart. And the big, biggest reason why we won't step into a room and be humble is many times it's something that comes with our old man, and that is pride and ego. We want to make sure that it's their turn to step up and say something. They did the wrong. They said the words. They did this. They did that. They owe me. And if they give that to me, then I will be gracious. Then I will be humble. But what if this is the year you choose to be like Jacob and come in with a humble heart, with a new identity, and allow God to do something that you're unable to do in yourself? Humility is not weakness. Humility is strength under control. Weak people have to act strong. Strong people don't. I read recently that Warren Buffett lives in his first house that he bought for $35,000. He bought it in the 50s. He's worth $107 billion. That's strength. I don't need a fancy car. I don't need a big house to prove how wealthy I am. But I know people in this area, they're up to debt in their eyeballs just trying to look as wealthy as they can. So who's the wise one? Who's the secure one? Who's the strong one? It's the one that has the strength but doesn't choose to flex it everywhere they go. Genesis 33 goes on, and uh, I mispronounced this earlier, some have said, but I ran it through the Texas Hebrew generator, and uh, this is just the way it comes out, so I'm sorry for those who it offends. I'm sure there's a better way to pronounce it, but I don't know how else to do it. Genesis 33, so that day Esau started on the way back to Sire, and Jacob, however, went to, well, this is how I see it, sucketh, <laughs> where he built a place for himself. Kind of like the King James Bible right now, y'all. Right. Went to build a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why it's called Sucketh. Um, enjoy. What did they do? These two brothers that had been odds for 20 years, rather than trying to live right next door to each other where one's herds would fall on their land and the other would fall and their men would get tangled up, they both went to different places to live. 
What is that space that we put into relationships so that we aren't trivially fighting over the trivial things of life? It's love. Love allows us to make room for the imperfections of others. Love creates in relationship the space for people to be imperfect. And I believe for some of us this holiday season that you need to stop wishing the people in your life were different. Stop comparing them to other families and other parents and other brothers and other sisters or friends that you know. Sometimes we take the, worst, the best behavior of strangers compared to the worst behavior of our family and then feel like we're the ones that are suffering because we're in that family. Some of us, when we go see our loved ones, we say, I wish my mom would. I wish my dad would. I wish my family would. It's time to lay that down and just create some space in that relationship and allow love, unconditional love of God. I'm not talking about just the love of, of phileo love, the love you know, of relationship, but I'm talking about the unconditional love of God, the love of God that says, listen, I love you for just who you are. Yes, I would love for better for us, but regardless, I choose to win with love. I choose to make space with love. I choose to give you the room to be imperfect. I choose you to give you the room to say those stupid things that you always say at every single family gathering we have. I choose to give you that space, not because I'm weak, but because I'm strong. Because strong people don't have to flex every time there's an opportunity. Sometimes we can just sit back and take a load, and take, a, take a burden and carry it ourselves. And what these two brothers did is they had some space between their flocks and their families so that they could stay in right relationship with one another. And for some of us this year, what I want to encourage you is broaden the borders of what causes pain in your life. Make a decision to not hold them accountable for every imperfection and, and thing that they say, but say, you know what, I'm going to let love cover a multitude of sins this year. Our middle daughter, Allie, got engaged this year, and she's getting married next summer. Pray for us. <laughs> and uh, her boyfriend, her fiance, my soon-to-be son-in-law, called me and said he wanted to go to lunch. And I knew this was unusual, number one, because we've never gone to lunch. And number two, he lives in Tulsa, so it's not easy to get here. And I said, yeah, let's, let's meet for lunch. But I thought, if I'm going to have to listen to this, I'm going to eat a steak while I do it. So I picked out my favorite steakhouse. And, and I said, I'm going to eat a steak while he talks. And um, he told me a lot of wonderful things. He's a great, godly young man. But I had four things. And I told Julie about the phone call. She said, well, what are you going to say to him? And I said, well, I know there's... There's four things I'm probably going to say. One of them was this. I said, um, you have to love her for who she is. Don't marry her hoping that she'll change. Because she deserves better than that. You have to give her the room to grow, the room to be who she is. Develop, yes. Mature, yes. But if you're marrying her, think you're going to change her. Just let her go now. She deserves better than that. I think so many times in our relationships... We're frustrated with our relationships because they just, we wish they were different than they, who they are. But love loves you right where you're at. Most likely in this, in this church right now, if you're married, there's two people in this marriage. One is a very live in the moment, a budget is just kind of a suggestion. It's kind of a ballpark of how you spend money. You know, dishes can wait, hangers are for the weak, the floor is for the strong, right? You just, you kind of live in a chaos of life. The other one is like budget is gravity. It is the truth that life is built upon. You cannot work against it. Never changes. Everything's a pattern in their life. Saturday is this. Friday is this. Organized. They don't like last minute plans. They like to plan a month out in advance. And what happens in a relationship, in a marriage, when you have these two different people, but they don't give themselves broad borders, that marriage turns into fights and pain and difficulty over from some very simple things. The easiest way to fix a marriage that's struggling over these simple things is to give each other a little more border, give each other a little more grace. Y'all both live in two different cities, Sire and Succoth, or Sukut. <laughs> the border in between is what makes life good. It's what makes it strong. It makes, it makes room for differences. So one of you needs to probably loosen up that the tooth, if the toothpaste cap is undone, it won't break the fabric of time. Like in the camp, it's not closed. You know, it's not going to ruin the world. But the other one, maybe you need to step up. Maybe you need to figure out how to use a hanger and try it every once in a while. <laughs> maybe if you just wash the dishes, it'd be like an NFL, you know, play taper. Like, do, 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 do. you know, and they go in, kaboom, and he put the dish in the dishwasher. You know, maybe step up. Maybe help them. Maybe change a little bit for them, and they'll change a little bit for you. Maybe together you stop fighting over the borders and find a safe place in between that you kind of love and accept, because I'll be honest with you, I don't know if either one of y'all are right if you think your way is the only way. The only way is the Bible. Everything else is up for negotiation. 
And in relationship, we have to accept that. We got to make room for love, unconditional love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient. It's kind. Love is not jealous. It's not boastful or proud. Love is patient. Imagine that. Patient is tough sometimes. I don't like to be patient. I want them to hurry up so I don't have to be patient for so long. But scripture says love is patient and kind. It's not jealous or proud. It's not rude. It does not demand its own way. It isn't about to step on some toes. It's not irritable, even during the holidays. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice. But rejoices whenever truth wins out. It doesn't rejoice and say, listen, I told you I was right. But just says, let's just get to the bottom. Let's just get to the truth of the matter. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful. It endures through every circumstance. As scripture goes on to teach us about love, it says this, in the final conclusions of love, it says this, that when we choose to walk in love, we choose to grow up. When my girls were little, Maddie and Allie were 17 months apart, and so they were much like twins. People often thought they were, but they fought like brothers. Um, they were just, they would, we would, if we went on a road trip, they would, I don't know if you've had kids and they've ever had this fight, they're looking out my window, Dad. So Allie would be like, Maddie's looking out my window, and Maddie's like, I'm not, and she'd look over, like, you know, they're like, or they'd start pushing toys over, they had like a border, like a border fence there in the back seat of the car, she'd be like, she's on my side of the car, and I'm like, I'm going to leave y'all on the side of the road, I just, mom and I are going to go on family vacation without y'all, we're leaving you at a gas station, be back in a week, so y'all have fun, childish, childish, finding something to fight about, just to fight, but he says this, when I was a child, I spoke, and I thought, and I reasoned like a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Maybe for some of us, this holiday season, to have a better relationship. And what I'm preaching comes out easy, but it lives really hard. Is to grow up and look at relationships a little bit differently. I listened to someone teach recently about marriage and relationships and He said this, he was a psychologist, and he says, you know, disagreements are not a sign of a bad relationship. And he was speaking in the context of marriage, but I think it's true in any relationship. He says, disagreements are not a sign of a bad relationship. In other words, fighting is healthy, it's okay, as long as there's no rage involved, there's no name-calling. He says, conflict's just part of relationship. He goes, but here's the key to prove if that relationship will endure forever. It's, do you fight, do you resolve, but then can you live in peace? And he says, as long as that cycle of fighting, resolution, and peace continues, you can have a relationship that lasts a lifetime. But as soon as that cycle, maybe you fight, but you don't resolve, or maybe you can't live in peace, is broken. He says, that relationship is doomed for breakup. And I think in our life, the idea that we have in our mind, like if we truly are a perfect couple or we're truly a perfect family, we'll never have disagreements, is really tough to achieve that in life because we're all such unique and different people. But maybe the goal should be resolution and peace so that we can walk together and still be as unique as we are. The last thing I say to you is this. Love makes room for the imperfections of others. So maybe this holiday season, as you see the people that you love and see the people that frustrate you, let love make some room for their imperfections. Let love do that. Not compromise, not sweeping things under the rug, a conscious decision, I'm going to love them right now in an unconditional way. I'm doing that because I'm strong enough to love them unconditionally. Weak people can't love unconditional. Only strong people can. So let's stand this morning. I want to pray for us. Let's just lift our hands to heaven, if you don't mind. Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. You are the master, the teacher. We are the students. And I pray for all of us in this room that some of us are going to see people that's a lot of joy and enjoyment. But, Father, some of us are going to see and be in contact with people that reminds us of pain from the past or difficulty. And I just ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would come and take and apply not my words, but your word into the hearts of every person here. The Father, as they step into these relationships, maybe even in their own marriage, God, the Father, you'll make room for peace and you'll make room for joy like they've never experienced before. That the conflict of their relationships, Father, 
they'll find resolution, that love will make a way, that love will bring peace, that humility will bring connection, God. And I just thank you for that right now. And I pray for those in this room that suffered emotional pain, God, genuine emotional suffering. Lord, I pray for your healing balm to be in them today. God, I pray that you would knit together their soul. And Father, even though they've maybe been let down and unloved by important people in their life, they are dearly loved by their Heavenly Father. That you have never left their side. That you saw such value in them that you sent your only son to die for them so that you could be in relationship with them today. If they are loved by no one, they are loved by you. And I pray that right now in this room, for those who feel that brokenness in their soul, who feel that loneliness of that lack of connection, God, that they would feel your love. God, pour your love into them right now, that, Father, they would feel your embrace. They would feel you today working in their life. Father, we love you today, and we're grateful for your goodness in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're in this room and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity to meet him today. God loves you so much. God wants to be in your life. And you say, Eddie, I've made so many mistakes. He already knows you made mistakes. He, he calls it sin. And he says, I'm willing to forgive you of all that sin if you simply put your hope in me. Romans 10 says this, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, <clears throat> you will be saved. I'm going to pray a prayer with everybody in this room. And if you're willing to take that step and you say, Eddie, when you pray that prayer, would you include me in that prayer? Can you lift your hand real quick? I just want to see who I'm praying with today. You say, that's me. Amen. Who else? If you haven't raised your hand already, let me see it this morning. Amen. Let's all pray <coughs> this prayer with those, excuse me, with those <coughs> that raised their hands. Everybody say this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you'd forgive me of my sins. <coughs> I ask you to be the Lord of my life. And I choose to follow you. <coughs> With all of my heart, from this day forward, in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for all of us in this room. I pray that, Father, that we would make this world a better place by loving people the way you loved us. God, I pray that whether, whether it's this week praying with a coworker, whether it's buying a coffee or even a turkey for a stranger, whether it's inviting them to church or inviting them to Christmas services, God, that you would use us to let this world know that you love them and that you want them and that they matter to you. God, I thank you for the boldness and the courage to do it. Father, I thank you for those that made this decision today. The Father, this is a day that they will never be the same. Father, this is a day where they transferred from darkness to light, where they began a relationship with you, that heaven is their home and we are their new church family. And I just thank you for that today. <clears throat> In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God praise. <clears throat> I was doing so good. I was like, I'm not even going to cough. <clears throat> that starts sounding like Beetlejuice trying to hold it back. <clears throat> um, anyway, the last thing we're going to do today is give. And <clears throat> I just want to remind you all that on December the 4th, we're taking up our Heart for the House offering. Um, we're believing God for $90,000. And all I ask is that you pray about what your part is and do whatever he tells you to do, whether it's small or big. really doesn't matter to me. You just obey Jesus. This is his church. And everything he gives us is his, scripture says, and uh, this is not our home. So just pray, obey him in that. But today we'll just re receive our normal tithe and offering. Proverbs 3, 9 says, On the Lord <clears throat> with your wealth, with the best part of everything you produce. And then he'll fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow. Uh, in just a second, we'll, we'll open up the altars. We're going to worship our way out of here today. For those giving in cash or check, there's envelopes in the back of your seat, collection boxes, and they're in the sound booth. There's also a little black card with a QR code if you want to give through a credit card or a debit card this morning. So let's pray over our giving. And as I'm praying, prayer team, if y'all can slip on down here. And we want to pray with you regardless of what that need is. Maybe you prayed that prayer with me today for salvation. Maybe you're going to see some family members. Maybe there's a health need in your home, a financial need in your home. Maybe you need wisdom about a decision. Maybe there's a child that's kind of off on their own and you're really hoping they'll come home for Christmas or Thanksgiving. You just need the wisdom to say what you need to say and, and do it with grace and love. Whatever that is, we want to pray with you today. But let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you today and I thank you for this opportunity to worship you with what you blessed us with. I pray, Father, as we give, that we trust you in it. Father, where our treasure is, Jesus taught, that's where our heart is. And Father, our heart's in the kingdom. Our heart's in heaven. Father, we know this is a temporary experience, but we have an eternal home. 
And so, Father, we honor you with what you blessed us with. Thank you for giving us the breath in our lungs, the wisdom in our mind, the skill in our hands, Father, to do what we do, and we honor you with it, and we thank you for that. I pray, Father, those what remains in our hands as a family, God, that you'd bless it. Father, what's in the hands of this church will be incredible stewards over. And, Father, we just thank you together. We're working towards your, your will and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.